So uh, I'd like to start by talking about the art of song. Uh, it seems like, for those who do it correctly, uh, the conventional wisdom that's universal is that you act the song. Uh, even, mm. even for those who aren't professional actors, whether it be a, a blues singer or a Broadway musical singer, right? Yeah. So can you talk a bit about um, how you approached acting these songs, Hank Williams' songs? Well, the, the thing I knew I had to do um, in taking on this role was to try... You're trying to rep... I was going to represent Hank Williams' experience of the world, his truth, his joy, his pain, his struggles, um, dressing like him, sounding like him, speaking like him, and singing like him. And I think songwriting and singing and playing was like me to drink to Hank Williams. I think it was like as natural as breathing oxygen. He just uh, did it. And, and, and he always carried a pen and pencil and he wrote songs. And, and the reason he had such an impact is because they were so authentic. And, and the commitment of his sincerity inside the songs is, is profound. Uh, and in order to transmit that, or translate that, as an actor, I had simply to make that emotional commitment myself, to try, having constructed the filter, the exterior filter, of looking like him and sounding like him, to, um, to live inside the, the, the feelings he's talking about, which are loneliness and sadness and, uh, conversely, you know, um, kind of also the joy of performance. Yeah, exactly. Joy and flirtatiousness, and I think he was actually, you know, he had a, he had an incredible charisma, and um, he was very connected to his sexuality. He was basically flirting with the whole audience, um, and so there's this combination of of um, of that of, of the of the very positive energy, the very generous spirited energy, and this much more internal turbulence. Um, Really, it's a question of, of, of emotional commitment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you mentioned uh, Hank Williams' lonesomeness for both of you. Uh, I, a question that maybe is impossible to answer, but what do you think drove that lonesome feeling for him? Because he was surrounded by people all the time. I know. I always think that. I'm always, it always makes me wonder. Um, I don't. No, if maybe I think maybe as a child he was very solitary. That's just, that's that's based on nothing apart from a, 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 a sort of internal suggestion of mine. Is that he was, I think he was quite a solitary child, and I think even as he got surrounded by more and more people, I don't think he found it easy to be intimate, truly intimate. I think he kept people at arm's length with wit and mischief and energy and. Banter, you know, especially I think I think his friends, his male friends, um, and his band members, and his, there were people who there was a very there was obviously a very superficial um, pattern of just you know um, boys playing around, yeah. and I think with women he had a different intimacy, specifically with his first wife Audrey, and with his mother Lily, but still. I think he felt like they didn't understand him. There was something distant about him. Um, and maybe it was the act of songwriting itself, is that it was such a personal, um, it was such a personal thing for him, and he couldn't share it with people. Um, I've never got to the bottom of it. I just know it was there, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, so Mark, uh, you decide to make this film, you write the script, how do you come to Tom? Uh, uh, and what did it take to win the role? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was no really winning the role. Um, and that's, you know, I, I think conventionally when you start out, I don't think as a, a writer or a director you think of, I, I never think of in terms of winning. I, in terms of tomorrow in the NCAAs, I'll think about who's going to win. But I'm not thinking about winning when it comes to performance or artist or you know, people that you're going to work with to try to create something that is an emotional resonance. Um, what happens is you write something and it's all in your head, you know, it's just there. And sometimes you have people in mind. Uh, 
uh, sometimes you've been commissioned to write something specifically for someone. Um, but in this case, I didn't really, all I had in mind was the character and which way I was going to approach the character. And the way I was going to approach the character was in one way conventional in the sense that it, I wanted to have the episodes of his life that I did portray be sequential, but I didn't want to go anywhere beyond certain things. So when you talk to, to Tom about loneliness, uh, I think, like Tom said, and you implied, it's a, it's all, I think it's an unanswerable question, really. And I didn't want to try to answer it because to me that was like being a psychiatrist. When it got to trying to cast, begin to cast the role, I had a sort of protocol that I was certain I was going to employ. employ. The protocol was I would meet all these different actors who, or whatever actors were interested in the role. There were a lot because it was meaty um, and it was challenging. Uh, and so that's how I began to, to think about it. And then I came across Tom in a film, War Horse. Uh, and he was magnetic in, in what was not a large role, and I didn't even know who he was really because I had not been able to see, I had not seen the stuff that he'd done, which was quite extensive by the way, a lot of stuff, theater and television and you know other smaller roles and things, but I had not really been able to identify him. But when I saw him in that film, I got him, and I went, wow, that guy's really, because it was a really interesting role. It was a tough guy and all this, but at the same time there was happy compassion and, and he wrote these beautiful letters anyway, so, and I also noticed his resemblance to Hank. And that was, it, to me, really clear. And so ultimately I reached out to his agent, who reached out to him, he fell for the script, said it really touched him, and then what it becomes is not about, for me, not about winning, it's like, wow, okay, but am I in sync? Yeah. Are we in sync? And we really, without, he never read one line of the script to me. He never recited yeah. one thing. He never put on an accent for me. He yeah. never said, sang a song for me. None of that took place. We just simply met and talked, first on Skype and then in, in, a, in, a, in a restaurant. And it was this intelligence, this was, it was this intensity about how he thought this role should be, you know, should be at, uh, performed. And then it was literally like, hell, nobody's going to be better than this guy. There's not. I don't care what, I don't care how well they read it, I don't care if they could sing or not sing. This is, and we made a bond on the, on the first time we met each other in person. We made a bond to stick together to get the film made. And by the way, that, that leap of faith is something that, as an actor, is very rare. And that you, is, is, a, is, a, is something you want to honor with, with. The fact that he didn't, the fact that Mark didn't felt confident enough in me to, um, not to sort of, to, to test me or challenge me, he just believed in me. And, and, and people who do that are very, in this business, are very few and far between. And so when somebody does that, you want to honor that belief with every, every fiber of your being. That's interesting. I, I would, my, my first thought would be that it would be very empowering uh, to have that kind of trust, but it would be a, a kind of a, almost a humility about that, like a, a trust being placed in you. Yeah, well, well I suppose it, it was empowering, and Mark had, it, there were moments along the way where Mark had more faith than I did. Because, um, you know, you step into these boots, and look at this hat right yeah. here. You know what I mean? There he is. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a, it is a daunting prospect. Um, but Mark always believed in me, and it was something that actually just re every time it it re um, reassured me, and it gave me further courage to just keep to keep going, to keep climbing the mountain. You know, even though it was high and hard hard to climb, um, you just want to make good on that because it's a beautiful thing. Honestly, it's a very in this business, a very <laughs> rare thing yeah, yeah. for people to do that. Well, I'll tell you what's interesting, the other interesting aspect about it is, is that when people write about Hollywood or talk about Hollywood or talk about Hollywood in the sense of the film business, they can't help but believe that almost every decision is based upon some cynical idea. There's a cynicism in it or a business idea to it. And there was none of that. He didn't know what was going to happen in terms of, because he'd done 
serious stuff, you know. Yeah. And I went over and saw him do Coriolanus in the, the yeah. Donmar warehouse, and you know that's that's a major thing, you know. And that was that blew me away. I mean, there was nothing, no version of <laughs> you could, could have done in some small room with a little camera and a bunch of studio guys standing behind me that could have said to me, "Wow, this guy, you know, how much power he had." Yeah. But it, there was nothing cynical about it. He didn't know what was going to happen in the next moment. None of us do, of course, in our careers. And I didn't know that Tom was going to get a following as a character in another film. I mean, I knew he was doing his films. They hadn't come out. We didn't know what was going to happen. There was no way. He would have, there was not, if I would have, he would have bet everything that it wouldn't have gone to where it went to. Yeah. I promise you, he never thought that. Yeah. Never yeah. crossed his mind. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Well, one of the things that's uh, great about the film is that it's just suffused with so much detail about Hank Williams' life that, that the average, you know, kind of casual uh, person might not know about him. Uh, for me, one of those things was the spinal bifida occulta. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about that. One, one of the things that's very striking in the film is uh, the, the way that he is ministered to, to in quotation marks, yes. um, with this choral hydrate, it, it really seems so modern, like like the Michael Jackson story. Like you talked about, he's like the rock star of his day. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, what what were your thoughts about um, how how all that went down and what it what it meant to the rest of his life? How it affected the rest of how he well, viewed his life? That's the key. We were talking about loneliness and all these people around him, and he had people who 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 could have cared for him, perhaps, or helped him out better. Mm -hmm. His mother, Lily, mm -hmm. Red Rose, Red Rose, who'd been there, had been all the way to the bottom of. You know, he'd hit rock bottom. He had been a, um, he's a reformed alcoholic. Um, but Hank didn't look for help in those places. And instead, he took the advice of a, of a quack, of somebody who bought his um, medical degree in a gas station. Right? It was, yeah. You know, somewhat, this to Toby Marshall character, very, very shady character, um, who, who was one, who I think was deeply cynical and was trying to make a quick buck out of Hank Williams' fame. Um, it's one of those weird, creepy, it was, in my mind he was a very creepy human being. Um, somebody who had a sort of, who obviously had a lot of charisma that was very superficial and, and, and um, a surface confession about him. Um, but he obviously was able to meet Hank on some kind of level and gain his trust but the, the help that was administered to him, which are, they are, they are sedatives, they're very heavy sedatives, you know, uh, designed, I think it's in the script, designed to sedate circus animals, which basically just takes all the juice out of you. That could, God, I can't even imagine what that does to your heart, literally to the muscle of your heart. Mm -hmm. You die of heart failure. Um, and to your biochemistry which is why I think he couldn't see straight, couldn't think straight, he couldn't keep on a schedule. Um, yeah, so I have, I mean, I, we, our film isn't, 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 isn't very um, compassionate about Toby Marshall, but I, because that's how I think Toby Marshall was, was, was part of his downfall. You know? When he went to jail a couple times, Toby Marshall, and I think it is modern. I mean, it's, it, it, it doesn't just happen to performers. But yeah. we, we, we see it. We've seen it in Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and Jim Morrison and Keith Charlie Ledger. Parker yeah. and Keith, Keith yeah. Ledger. I mean, it goes on and on because of various aspects. But of course, I promise, I know you know someone in your life that somewhere, whether directly or indirectly, has had to deal with this kind of thing. But this was, this was really potent stuff this guy was giving him. And, and, and the spina bifida occulta was uh, because, of course, in those days they didn't have the same medical, you know, knowledge that we have, and also he came from a very, very poor situation. So they saw this thing in his back; it was a bump. They didn't really know what to do with it. The doctors that probably were available were not that interested in going in and doing back mm -hmm. surgery. So he came to live with it, and it became a part of his life, which was that he was in a there was always a sense, a constant bit of pain in his physical being. And that, I'm sure, contributed to the fact that he was looking for ways to alleviate it, whether it was alcohol or anything sex or, any, sure. or anything you can look for. Um, to, to pedal back to a sure. more uh, pleasant topic uh, <laughs> of, uh, of preparing to, to be uh, Hank the Musician, uh, 
Can you guys tell me a bit about Rodney Crowell? I mean, he's a country western artist in his own right, and, yeah. and, and from the sound of it, quite a character. But uh, can you talk about the, your process of sitting down with him for weeks, really, right? Yeah. Uh, to be yeah. coached, uh, yeah. you know, sort of hand coached by. Rodney is our, is our absent brother today. Mm -hmm. um, he, we, neither Mark nor I could have made this film without him. Um, he was um, he was more than a teacher. He was a, he was a guide for me through through the culture of the South, through the through the tradition of, of blues music, of country music. Um, his own personal connection is is remarkable. He he remembers as a two year old um, on his own father's shoulders who worshipped Hank. Um, this must have been in 1952. Um, Rodney Crowell, two year old boy on his dad's, on Crowell Senior's shoulders, watching Hanks play live from, from a distance. He, one of his earliest memories. And then to have committed a life to music. Rodney's been make, living in Nashville, making music for 40 years. Um, he's collaborated with everybody from Johnny Cash to Emmy Lou Harris. Uh, you know, he, he got Johnny Cash to sing Walk the Line on a song, on a rewrite of Walk the Line that he wrote. He's still <laughs> tickled by it. Yeah. Um, and Rodney, Rodney has this music in his bones. Um, he's also a very articulate man, a very intelligent and sensitive artist in his own right, as it was able to, for me to deconstruct um, in a way that was palatable uh, or digestible um, Hank's music, um, and it was it was it was technical work and interpretative work and the most joyful kind of work. Um, he was able to. I, I moved in with him. He lives in um, just outside of Nashville in Tennessee. It was the best kind of, you know, just like get Immersion. out of London, yeah. immerse myself in it. And he, and he, we did fascinating things. We talked about because I, I had a uh, training in um, in classical theatre. I spent my twenties on the stage in London, um, and and in that three year training, you 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 are taught the basics of. Of, of voice placement. Yeah, voice placement, physiognomy, resonance, how to project your chest resonance so that if you're doing a Shakespeare play to an audience of 2,000, they can yeah. hear you at the back. Right. You know, so I understand, you know, things like con breath control, rhythm, pitch. Um, and he understands that too. And so he was able to, to sort of take Hank's music and, and, and help me listen to it in a particular way right. and then manipulate my own instrument mm -hmm. to sound like him. So there was the technical aspects, and then there was just the joy of playing it all. You know, we would have we would have long afternoons in September of 2014 as the sun was waning outside, with two guitars um, and his little spotted dog Mono sitting in his sound studio, just rocking, just rocking out. But yeah. we'd take breaks, and he'd take me through because Hank was essentially a blues singer and was taught blues probably as a child. Had 20 years of playing blues before he was a star, and I was compressing all of that into four or five weeks. So we would take breaks from Hank and sing Jimmy Rogers and Jimmy Reed and Harmon Wolf, and he'd break down the chord progressions in All My Lovin' because he thought it was beautiful, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was just a wonderful thing. It's that, you know, he is almost with his fantastic collaborators in Nashville, Ray Kennedy. Um, the, band, the, the, the musicians he put together to, to, to form the band, Gilly Roswell, our producer, but, but, but you know, it, aside from the, from the music he made for this film and the music he helped me make, it's, one of the, it's an experience I'll treasure for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah, that's when you say it's the actor's life for me, right? <laughs> right, like, yeah. How did I get here? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, my favorite song, by the way. Ah. Talking, talking <laughs> right. Yeah, I love the talking. Um, so, uh, what do you think, uh, for both of you, what do you think drew Hank to Audrey? Why, why, what, what was the bond there that, that kept them in the uh, well, I, I think that's just... Uh, Another you know, there's, a, there's a great old blues song saying it's yeah. the same thing. It's the same thing, make a hound dog howl all night. It's the same thing to make a preacher lay his collar down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I think when it gets to that, that's, yeah. that, that's what it was. I mean, yeah. I think you don't start, let's, let's put it this way, you don't go beyond anything unless you've got the, 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 the sexuality, the magnetism, the, you know, you, you have the attraction. So he was obviously 
clearly attracted to her. And I think, you know, he was attracted to powerful women. His mom was a real strong person and raised him by herself to the extent that she, and was his manager. And mm. so he ran across this woman and she spotted in him, I mean, obviously she felt the same way about him. And, but I think, you know, very quickly also saw that Hank was a guy of great talent or certainly was on the rise and potentially had some, and she wanted to be involved in that. Uh, so I think, you know, that it started with the same old thing and it ended with the same old thing. It's just like, it's rough. Yeah. And, and show business, this, a lot of it, this film, to people who are really, if they're paying attention, and Tom and I talk about this all the time, if they're really paying attention to it, the movie is a lot about show business. It's about being a performer. It's about the pressures that come. It's about fame. It's about things that, we're not saying they're bad. We're just saying they come with a the price. Yeah, they yeah. just come with a price. So, yeah, they come with a good price. They get a lot of good things happen. There was a scene in the, in the film uh, that was sort of cut back, which was with the scene in Hollywood where the first introduction with, with Dor Sherry is, Fred says, how are you doing? He says, I'm doing fine. If you, could, you know, if you call begging movie stars to take roles which will get them more money, more yeah. fame, more <laughs> women, and more better seats in restaurants. Right. Yeah. That's one side of it. And the other side of it is a lot of you gets bitten out by a lot of people, take a lot of chunk. Yeah. You know it going in, but they take a chunk. Yeah. And so, you know. Yeah. You, you and know. also this, uh, as Hank says in the film, comes with a job. Uh, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the end of my time is, is nigh here, but uh, since I haven't gotten to speak with Tom before, I do want to ask one obligatory Loki question. If you, if you okay. Say uh, so, Kenneth Go at your, your own peril. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, Kenneth Branagh, who you've worked with quite a bit, established the house style for the, the Thor universe, yeah. uh, which I think is wisely theatrical, um, uh, with a kind of you know, pronounced grandiosity. And without that, I think, without a commitment to that, it would mm. seem very silly. Um, so I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit about finding Loki under, under his direction. Sure. That's a good question about right Loki. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the best question we can ask about. What would you say? Yeah, right it's up great. There? It's great. Um, well, you know, uh, I was so lucky that by the time I, I, I was cast as Loki, Kenneth Brown and I had worked together for about a year. Um, and it was all, it's so easy to, to retrospectively join the dots in a neat way. It was such an accident. Um, we, we, had, we suddenly we did a television show with Wallander, we did a Chekhov play called Ivanov, and, and we, you know, knocked ten bells of ideological writing out of each other on stage every night in the West End, and he, we knew each other, and he, we knew our, I knew his passion, and he knew mine, and, and, um, and I think the smartest decision he made was, was he, he read all the comics, and he looked at all the Norse myths, and his, his pitch to Marvel as a company was inside all the things, it was a, you know, they were, it was a delicate property, they were nervous about it. You've got a guy who's got feathers in his helmet, um, you've got a rainbow bridge, you've got horses with eight legs, um, and it's very fantastical how to ground this thing. And he said it's really simple, you make it about family. Thor, the, the, the trajectory of Thor is very similar to um, Prince Hal and Henry V, of a, of a, of a lost, hot-headed, um, wayward prince who, who goes on a journey of earning um, or becoming worthy of his title. He has a brother who is illegitimate, um, who is uh, intelligent, and has all the gifts of, sort of, different gifts to his, you know, um, their chalk and cheese, their Cain and Abel, their, they are there's something eternal about the Warren Brothers. They're both competing for their father's affection. Um, and so we, we built him out of, out of Shakespearean templates. It was, we, 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 we picked. Iago in Othello has an extraordinary capacity for improvisation. He's, he's able to manipulate every situation very quickly to his advantage. Cassius in Julius Caesar is described as having a lean and hungry look. We stole that. Yeah. Um, in King Lear, there are two brothers, one legitimate, one illegitimate, Ed Edgar and Edmund. Edmund hates Edgar because the legitimate son has all of the favors of the father. And, looked, and Edmund does all he can to bring his father and brother down. Those were things we just meshed into Loki. We looked at the look, I dyed my hair black, 
what's he the god of? He's the god of mischief. Yeah. Mischief means you've got to have fun. Um, and that was my starting point, really. It was just, you know, with those keys, you've got your, basically, you've got your, those things are like notes of a chord, and that was my chord, and I just then, that's, that, and then you just play. We brought it back to music. Perfect. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, guys. This was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. That's why we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Yeah, nice interview. Thank you very much.